Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the series Muslim Relations with Christians, Jews and Others. I am your host Muhammad Nuruddin Lemu and with me to discuss today's topics are two of our distinguished facilitators, uh, experts and trainers in this area, Sister Salatu Suleh and Brother Nasir Beldo. You are both most welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, in this episode, I'd like to discuss a couple of issues. One, this idea of purity of non-Muslims. We have some Muslims who view non-Muslims as not pure. We have some who feel you shouldn't work with non-Muslims, you shouldn't obey non-Muslim leaders, and some even say you shouldn't live among non-Muslims, and they bring hadith uh, and uh, evidence to try and buttress that point. I'd like to start with a verse of the Quran in Surah At-Tawbah, chapter 9, verse 28, where Allah says that the mushrikun, or the polytheists, are najas, are impure or unclean. And this has been interpreted uh, in various ways, but the worrying is where some interpret it to mean they are physically unclean, even though he might have bath and is cleaner than you physically, but that they are physically najas, they are physically unclean, impure, uh, you have to be careful accepting things from them, wearing clothes, um, shaking hands, uh, allowing them into the mosque. Um, and this has just fed a stereotype of greater otherizing and uh, dehumanizing uh, people of other faiths. What is the correct understanding of this verse from its own context? What do scholars say? Brother Nasir, what would you start with? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلاة وسلام على رسول الله وبعد دا فاس يا أيها الذين آمنوا إنما المشركون نجس فلا يقرب المسجد الحرام بعد آم بعد آم وهذا uh, is a verse that Allah talked about that Allah سبحانه وتعالى talked about uh, the polytheist as نجس and that they shouldn't come near the Masjid al-Haram from that particular ayah. That's the Masjid was, of Makkah. The Masjid of Makkah because it was revealed, it was a verse that was revealed in the ninth year after Hijrah. And if you look at the history of what usually the polytheists do around the Kaaba in the name of pilgrimage, uh, as you can see in many ahadiths of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, among which where Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said uh, it has been forbidden this kind of worship and that is tied to the revelation in fact the, 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 the reason for the revelation of that particular verse where people do the wafs so I complete the Kaaba naked so these are some of the acts they perpetrate so on that particular ninth year the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent Ali ibn Abi Talib to go and announced that from this year Allah and his messenger have provided uh, certain acts and part of which he mentioned this issue of or yalan. And then he quoted this particular verse that was revealed in Namal Mushrikuna Najasun Falayakarabul Masjid al Haram Ba'da Ami Haza. Now, the issue of contention in this verse, according to scholars, is this concept of Najas. Najas, usually, uh, even in Arabic language, can be hissi and ma'anawi. It can be literal it could be physical referring to something that is physical and it could be metaphorical that is talking about uh, not just something that is deity in terms of meaning and even in language generally you could say uh, this is a deity statement mm. this is a deity object mm. this is so it depends on the context within which uh, you are talking about that is generally what is understood linguistically and Therefore, uh, if you look at, and when it comes to text, usually understanding the meaning of text is tied to looking at the context of revelation as we explained, and not only that, looking at other sources, other verses in the Quran, other prophetic ahadith on that particular subject, then they, they give some clarity what kind of najas is being referred to. And if you look at also the life of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions, you will definitely understand that this has nothing to do with physical, you know, najas. Mm -hmm. It is, according to most scholars, referring to the purity of the soul or belief. Mm -hmm. That for a Muslim who believed, mm -hmm. 
he is pure because of that qualify qualification that of tawheed. belief, that tawhid. Mm. Mm. So that is what is referred to. And the najas is that of shirk, mm. that of associated uh, partner to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And lots of examples will, you know, will, 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 will clarify or will attest to that. One of which is, uh, if that is the understanding of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, probably he wouldn't have allowed the, you know, the polytheists of Banu Saqib, mm. who visited the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, were accommodated in the mosque. Yes. Though some scholars will say beside the mosque, their tent was built beside the mosque, but they were accommodated and they were engaged by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And another good example is the Nasara Najran, mm. the Christian of Najran that came to see Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about 30 of them, if I could remember. 60, I think. About mm. 60 of them, if I could remember. They were accommodated, they were accommodated inside the mosque. Mm. They engaged Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, treated them with respect. And in fact, when it comes to their service, mm. they were allowed to, serve, to do their own form of worship inside the mosque of, the, of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina. So these are examples that clearly demonstrate this verse is not in any way talking about physical purity is rather talking about this purity of belief this purity of you know iman and tawhid which they don't have so now if for example a non-muslim accepted islam suddenly what actually changed in him it's just the belief and he sees from being the najas of you know uh of, of lack, lack of having that purity of iman to to to, to becoming a mu'min and that najas just fades away immediately. So that is what most scholars understood when looking at the context of the revelation of that particular verse and not only that, when looked at along other sources of the Quran and Sunnah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is interesting. In other words, it's the purity of Tawheed that is being juxtaposed with the Najas of Shirk. Uh, that that is what it and as you've said if a non-muslim is standing uh, a mushrik is standing you say the belief is not just but the moment he utters shahada uh, he is pure in other words the impurity is not uh, to do with his physical state exactly. what more sister salah can you give us from the point of view of sira scholars and how this was understood um, the last point you made regarding what is considered to be not just is the belief is the same opinion that was shared by Ibn Abbas and al Qutubi cited um, his explanation, that's Ibn Abbas's explanation, where he said, what is considered najas with regard to the mushrik, that is the polytheist, is the shirk, the act of associating partners with God, serving more than one God. And therefore, when one says najas in this context, it's actually referring to the belief, not to the physical person. We also have the explanation um, that's given by Atabari, where he was um, narrating, you know, the incident where Hudayfa, one of the companions, radiallahu anhu, was walking and the Prophet, peace be upon him, took him by the hand and he said, I am impure, meaning um, he was referring to a state of um, impurity. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, then replied that a believer is never impure. So he... Um, Udayfa used the same term but was referring to his physical self and the Prophet peace be upon him then corrected him saying when you say it that way it cannot apply to you so once the, you take these two um, things together it just underscores the point made earlier by Brother Nasir that if one wants to interpret that verse in light of these then the um, obvious interpretation is it's a matter of faith their belief that is impure, not the person. And we can then see why um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, seemed comfortable accepting gifts of clothing, bedding, uh, food, utensils, accepting and using these things, even when they came from non-Muslims. And we've mentioned in a previous example, when we're talking about using utensils of um, non-Muslims and polytheists, that... Uh, uh, Jabir radiallahu anhu even cited on occasion that we would get these things from them and we would use them and there was no objection to that. And when we put it in a practical term, sense and we look at the fact that Islam would, Islam permits a Muslim man to marry a woman from the people of the book, in practical terms, one can no longer be talking about um, 
impurity has been a physical thing. If not, the man can't even marry such a woman mm. in the first place. Mm. So it's a question of is there sh that element of shirk mm. in their belief system? Mm. That is what is considered impure. This is good. And uh, I think, you know, the references you've quoted Imam Tabari, Qurtubi, and I think even uh, Ibn Kathir for the Sabab al Nuzul, the context uh, mm -hmm. of the revelation, I think sheds a lot of light on this issue that the purity mm -hmm. is that of the belief and creed, the Tawheed uh, being uh, diluted with shirk, mm -hmm. uh, and not that non Muslims are physically impure. Yeah. There's another issue and some quote the Quran in Surah Al-Imran in chapter 3 verse 100, 101 yeah. um, where they understand Allah as saying to the believers um, not to follow uh, non-Muslims, um, to not follow them otherwise they will lose their own faith. Um, Based on this, some have understood, therefore, you can't be friends with people of other faiths, you shouldn't listen uh, to them, you can't be part of anything in which they are giving instructions, uh, and discourage Muslims from interacting uh, with people of other faiths. Um, what would you say about this verse of the Qur'an? Looking at the verse of the Qur'an, there are two ways to understand the particular verse among the usual ways that scholars use when trying to get at the meaning of a verse. One is to look at the words, you know, literal reading of the verse itself. The fact that um, in the verse, Allah is talking about a group of them, a group from among um, the people who have rejected faith and not talking of all of them. Because once um, in virtually any language, somebody refers to an entire group, then says a group of them, a party of them, which in simplest form is, form is some of them. We know it's not referring to all of them, that's one. Then the fact that um, what is contained there is do not follow them or they would lead you away. They wish to lead you away. So that's another important aspect of the verse to look at, that there is a reason why Allah is saying, you know, be mindful of this group when this purpose is behind whatever advice they are given. Another way of looking at this particular verse is to look at the context of Revelation, the Sobab al -Nuzur. What was going on at the time when the verse was revealed? Because scholars say this is what gives greater um, understanding of what was intended, what was the purpose, and in some cases, what was the specific purpose, even if the meaning can be extended to other um, situations. This particular verse that we are discussing was revealed at a time when there was um, an understanding between certain tribes who were formerly polytheists but had become Muslims, two tribes in par particular, the Banu Aus and the Banu Khazraj. And this unity was a good thing for the Muslim community in, in, community in particular and then for Medina as a whole. But there was a particular Jew who wasn't happy about that. He didn't want that to happen. And he was then trying to cause rivalry, the kinds that actually split people apart. So the verse was trying to address that kind of person, that kind of behavior, and ensure that Muslims do not make the mistake of taking advice or listening or emulating someone who has an ulterior motive, who has a negative um, purpose in mind for whatever advice they are given. That helps us understand the specific thing Allah was trying to address with that verse, which we can extend, like I said, to every other situation where we have to interact with various groups. It, however, does not in any way support the idea that therefore Muslims should not have any alliance or connection with non-Muslims. One has to say, what is the purpose of this alliance and what is the um, intent, as far as we can tell, of these people you are um, going into alliance with or taking advice from? This is, this is good to know because what it seems, you know, based on the verse is a warning against apostasy, against going back to Jahiliya. Okay. Um, Mala Nasir, what would you add? Well, I think uh, Usually what scholars encourage 
in trying to understand the meaning of a verse you do what they call minus five plus five um, so that you will be able to appreciate the context and what it's all about sometimes singling out a verse uh, might not necessarily give you an insight about what it entails but when you go back five verses or when you go forward five verses or both then you'll be able to understand the context within which that particular verse in question is uh, is talking. So the context of the text exactly, within the, the text. Exactly, the context of the mm. text within the text. Now, if you take the verse in question, where Allah says, Ya ayuha al-lazina amanu intu ti'u fariqu min al-lazina utu al-kitab ya ruddukum ba'da imanikum kafirin. Wa kayfa takfuruna wa antum tutla alaykum ayatullah wa fikum rasooli wa ma ya'tasim billahi faqad hudiya ila sirati mustaqim. Then you go further. Ya ayuha al-lazina amanu attaqu Allah haqqa tuqati wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Wa atasimu bi hablillahi jami'an wa la tafarragu. Wa dhkuru ni'mat Allahi alaykum idh kuntum a'adaan fa alafa bayna qulubikum. Wa azbahtum bi ni'mati ikhwana. Wa kuntum ala shafa hufrati min al-nari fa anqadakum minha. All these verses are talking about, first as she rightly mentioned, uh, it said fariqa min al-ladhina utul kitab a group that will misguide you so not all of them not all of them mm. not all of them and it's talking about not being distracted it's, uh, it's talking about unity and holding firm to the rule of Allah and this if you look at now the general uh, context of the verse and how it's talk about unity where the mention of the Ahlul Kitab, according to some, some scholars, is even attributed to the suburb of that, uh, I mean, the, 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 what, what led to the cause of that particular verse, where it was about a Jewish uh, uh, guy yeah. who attempted to create a problem, a function, function to remind the two tribes of Medina, the Aus and the Khazraj, of their old held animosity and conflict before the coming of Islam. And that was why Allah was reminding them, Allah was telling them that you should be thankful to Allah that he mended you and brought, them to, brought you together. You should remember the favors and the blessings of Allah unto you when you were divided, when you were enemies of one another. And that was how they were before the migration and the coming of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, And then Allah merged your hearts and you become brothers of one another. So if you look at these verses, then you will better appreciate and understand the context of that revelation. In, 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 in a nutshell, this verse is not in any way saying you shouldn't befriend people of other faith, you shouldn't relate with them. As again, we talked earlier that if you go and look at some other verses, you will understand that this discussion is context specific and it's talk, talking about some you know, uh, specific individuals or groups of the people of the book that are trying to delude or take astray the Muslims and distract them from their united front. So this is uh, what, 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 what the collection of these verses of 5 minus 5 plus 5 will always tell you. And usually with many issues, if you do that, then you'll be able to understand the context within which the Quran is speaking. Excellent. So minus 5 plus 5, yes. you know, general rule, go back five verses before the verse in question, yes. read five verses, and that usually uh, you know, Clarify gives you things. exactly what's the context of this verse. Um, sometimes, as you said, uh, it's also good to check again the sabab and nuzul, the context or the occasion of the revelation. And I think as you've mentioned, that of this uh, Jewish leader, uh, Sha'as bin Qais, if I recall his name, uh, as one who was trying to foment this trouble. But the verse, as you said, is talking about some of the Ahl al-Kitab, not all of them, uh, as we have many other positive verses, uh, you know, they are not the same in Ahl al-Kitab, Ummatun Qa'ima, among them are upright people, etc. No. The next uh, issue I would like us to look at is a very popular hadith um, uh, that is authentic. It's been uh, narrated in Abu Dawud, Nasai, uh, Tirmidhi, etc where the Prophet وسلم, is quoted as having said um, to Muslims that I disassociate myself from any Muslim 
who lives among mushrikun, lives among polytheists. This has been understood by some to mean that if the Prophet is going to disassociate himself from Muslims who live among non-Muslims, it's like saying he doesn't recognize your Islam, he has nothing to do with you. And it has been used by some to justify that a Muslim must not live in uh, a community that is predominantly non-Muslim. That the moment you embrace Islam, you must leave a non-Muslim land to Muslim lands. Um, some have understood this to simply mean Hijra means leaving non-Muslim lands to Muslim lands. The moment you are in a place of polytheists, you should leave. What is the correct understanding of this hadith? How is it understood by scholars who have studied it? I think just as we've discussed earlier with the verse we just finished discussion, discussing about, usually um, if you didn't, uh, if you don't understand what is the suburb nozul of a verse or what is the suburb root of a hadith and what is the context of the hadith. Mm, that's uh, the historical context. The historical context. Mm. Um, you are liable, you are, you are probably going to uh, create a meaning into the text that doesn't really necessarily exist. Mm. That is why they always say a text without context is a pretext. Mm. You, 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 you project some ideas and imagination into the uh, real message of the text. Usually you find yourself projecting some ideas that are not necessarily part of the text into the text. And if you are reading some of the views of scholars on many issues, you would find uh, some cultural, you know, uh, things that are tied to the, you know, context of the scholar manifesting in his reading of a particular text. So it is very important to always try to understand what is the context uh, of revelation or uh, within which Rasul made a certain comments. Um, otherwise, you would find certain interpretations conflicting with some other verses, some other hadith of Prophet Now, if you look at the hadith in question, if you look at the hadith in question, that interpretation that is quite general uh, will conflict naturally with many you know, uh, narratives about incidents where Rasulullah uh, uh, either command Muslims to go and live in a non-Muslim territory because it might be safer. Look at the case of the first Hijrah where Rasulullah because the situation was so difficult and hard for the companions, he sent some of the companions to go and uh, 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 to migrate to Abyssinia, which is a non-Muslim, an entirely non-Muslim. But he said because the ruler there is a just person and he felt they will be safe there compared to the context or the situation they found themselves in Medina. And in fact, even migrating to Medina, Rasulullah was saying about Mecca, he said, you are my root. I love you, Mecca, but just because I was forced to leave you, because the situation was quite tough and difficult, that was why I had to leave. Otherwise, I would love to have been in, in Mecca. So uh, 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 the, the situation mm -hmm. that led to migration was because they were not safe. Mm -hmm. It's not the kufur it, or the disbelief. It's not the issue of the kufur or disbelief. And, and, and of course, messengers usually are sent to convert, to guide people. So at the time they were sent, I mean, you can, you can, you can, you can count if you reflect through history. When it was only the Prophet that was a Muslim, mm -hmm. then Aisha or Abu Bakr, then, then you keep counting with your hands. How do you keep, you know, the numbers kept increasing. If you take this argument of non-Muslim are dissociated, uh, I mean, Muslims are dissociated with being non-Muslim, then how do you explain this context? Not only that, if you look at, uh, if you look at the case of Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam, just like Ja'far ibn Abdul Muttalib was among the migrants to Abyssinia, and he was there for a long time, even after migration to Medina, when the Medina state was established, they didn't come back immediately. And even when some of them decided to come back, including Ja'far, I think it was the second year after Hijra, others were left there amidst the population of non-Muslims. Not only that, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, even after migration to Medina, after accepting Islam and 
uh, according to some narratives, he proclaimed, uh, he, he accepted Islam immediately after Badr. Mm. He stayed in Medina uh, until, Mecca. sorry, he stayed in Mecca mm. for quite a long time. And nobody sees the need, yeah. the Prophet wasallam. And it is not only Abbas, there are other people that decide to stay in Mecca. I think until after the conquest of Mecca. Of course, after he, the conquest mm. of Mecca, then he decided to migrate. Mm. So you find lots of examples. And there is this uh, companion, uh, 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 Tufail. Ufail, one of the Ufail, Ufail at Tawsi, Ibn Amir at Tawsi, who came during the time of Rasulullah sallam in Mecca. He heard about Islam. He visited uh, the Kufar in Mecca. The Mushrikun decided to stop him. They, they, they brainwash him to, uh, you know, try to trying to uh, block him from accessing Rasulullah. Very interesting, you know, narrative as to regarding how he, in fact block his ears he went to kaaba he was doing the normal mushrikun tawaf and what have you but he doesn't want to hear even what rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, was saying when rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam was doing his own ibadah in, in the kaaba but he says somehow i was fascinated by the way he was doing his own form of ibadah because it was quite new it was uh, unusual it was unique and i got charmed i get i got closer and i got some part of what he was saying and since then, I couldn't stop. I followed him to his house, and then he recited surah. I told him, this is what I heard about you, but I want to know more. And Rasul recited, I think, surah al-Ikhlas and surah al-Nas to him. There and then he accepted Islam because he said, I am not ignorant. I read a lot. I know poetry, but this is just amazing. This cannot be uh, human. The wisdom that is loaded in is is just unique. After accepting Islam, he requested that he should be allowed to go back to his people. Rasul allowed him. So if staying, he's, he's not a Muslim. If there is a problem, if the, 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 there is a problem with a Muslim going to stay amidst non-Muslims, Rasul would have stopped him. He went there, he attempted to, you know, bring them into Islam. He tried to, he got some very few. He came back to Rasul, including Abu Huraira. He came back to Rasul and complained to him that they are so hesitant, they are resistant to accepting Islam. And what did Rasul said to him? Rasul prayed and he said, Go back and keep doing the awa. So some years after Hijrah, after Hijrah to Medina, he came with about 80 families, according to the, the narration. He came with about 80 families. So look at how Rasul encouraged him to go back to a situation that is not even friendly. But be because there is some level of tolerance that you need to, as a Muslim, it's part of the jihad, it's part of the struggle, actually, that as a Muslim, you should go and keep doing da'wah to this particular community. Sabr, yeah. With sabr. And that was actually what happened. And you could see the result. After migration to Medina, he came with about 80 uh, Muslim families that accepted Islam and are together with him. Uh, so, 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 so if you look at these examples, and there are many others. In fact, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa in Medina, it was not a homogeneous society. The society has different groups of, you know, Jews there. And there are some, you know, fraction of Christians that are around. Although they are not permanently there. But you have this cosmopolitan society where uh, you think about this idea of Sahifa to Medina. Because there are different groups, there are different interests. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa himself lived amidst non-Muslims. So again, another example is the companions of Rasul did not understood this hadith to generalize this idea of, you know, uh, uh, prohibiting living in a society that is uh, that of non-Muslims. Because after the demise of Rasul many of them travel out, uh, spreading Islam, teaching people about Islam, some of them were traders, some of them were involved in business. If you look at Africa, how did Islam come to Africa? Through Muslim traders. Through Muslim traders. So if they decide to say, okay, these are non-Muslims, and Rasul said he dissociated himself with coming to stay with non-Muslims. Some of the narratives said one of the companions of Rasul was in the Kanimburno Empire some few years after the demise of Rasul. This is demonstrating that they didn't understand this hadith uh, to be uh, generalizing that you shouldn't so the whole idea is about safety if you can have the freedom 
to practice your religion and to be the, the, the Khalifa of Allah on earth, to be that witness uh, to, to, to the message, to justice, and, 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 and become a representative, a model, the teaching of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can be anywhere. Allahu Alam. I think uh, the point you've made where Muslims always lived in multi-religious societies. Um, in Mecca, it was a multi-religious society. When the Prophet moved to Medina, it was a multi-religious society. When Sahaba moved to Habasha, Abyssinia, it was a multi-religious society. And after the Prophet died, uh, Sahaba moved to other multi-religious societies. Um, for da'awa, uh, you know, for enlightenment, for building peace treaties, trade. Um, they never understood any hadith or any verse of the Qur'an to mean that Muslims could not move to non-Muslim lands so long as there was safety and security. I'd like to, uh, you know, just come back to the hadith itself. The Prophet saying, I disassociate myself from Muslims living in non-Muslim uh, societies or societies of mushrikun. Um, okay, we've heard what it can't mean, but what does it mean, Sister Salah? What light can you shed for? So, what was the Prophet talking about? Um, again, we'll go back to the context, the Sobabul Wurud, so that we understand what preceded this particular statement. At uh, the time that statement was made, there was this particular um, tribe, Khotam. And they were in a state of hostility with the Muslims at the time. These hostilities were ongoing. And on a particular occasion, the Prophet, peace be upon him, then sent some of his companions to go carry out an attack. If I remember correct, correctly, it was sometime towards the nighttime or early dawn, but it wasn't fully bright at the time they went. So they got there and they carried out the attack. Then they came back. And after they had carried out the attack, they then realized that some of the people that had been killed were actually Muslims, but the tribe was predominantly a polytheistic tribe. Some of them had accepted Islam. The companions, when they went to attack the particular location, they thought everybody in that location were all among those fighting the against hostile, them, yeah. the hostile group. So they attacked and killed some of them. They said they actually found them in prostration, but they thought no, it's just a whole hostile group, so they killed them. When they found out, then they came back and they told the Prophet, peace be upon him, that this is what had happened. They had effectively killed Muslims um, during that attack, among others. Among others. Um, then the Prophet, peace be upon him, made that statement. If one looks at the statement, therefore, in the context and compares it with some of the other examples Brother Nasser has given, one knows first that he was speaking about this specific situation or, if anything, a specific sort of situation where you have Muslims living amongst um, non-Muslims who are hostile and their hostility, they're extending it to another Muslim group. Naturally, if there is um, an all-out war breaking out between the Muslims and this hostile group, if there are Muslims living in their midst, there's likely to be collateral damage. So the statement of the Prophet, peace be upon him at that time, was saying not liable to pay dear. That is how some scholars have interpreted this. That if the liability, if the word, you know, dissociates himself from such and such a group, it doesn't mean that he's saying you are no longer part of um, the Muslim community or you are no longer Muslims. That cannot be what it means, given the other instances where he encouraged um, Muslims like to fail um, at Dawsi to go back and live with his, um, in his community where they are polytheists, or where he said um, to Muslims, migrate from Mecca to Abyssinia, present-day Ethiopia. And the king, the ruler, the kingdom at the time was um, a Christian one. So if he would do this, then it cannot mean he's saying once you live among polytheists, you are no longer a Muslim, one. The other um, interpretation to be drawn from there is that statement based on what he did afterwards. Afterwards, he paid dear for the Muslims who were killed among the polytheists, but he paid half. That again is a symbolic act showing 
I won't pay full. I will not have the, you know, this full payment made because this particular context is different from your no normal context. And at the end of the narration, there was a statement he made that, you know, their fires should not be seen from there. There was a way it's phrased. And again, some scholars are commenting that that is saying they should have, they had that they should have taken responsibility for themselves to clearly separate themselves from a group who was acting in a hostile manner towards the Muslim community. When we look at it from this angle, and we look at it as a whole, then we understand that though the words seem to be general in application, I dissociate myself from Muslims who you know, live among polytheists, when you then go to the, um, you compare that statement, the hadith, the context, to all the other hadith, you know, okay, there seems to be a conflict here, or a contradiction. Then we look at the Sobab al-Wurud, and we can then see how this contradiction um, can be resolved, that it's really not a contradiction. In other words, what some scholars are looking at is by the Sabah al wurud number one, it is not, it's not saying anything about Muslims should not live among non-Muslims. No, it no. is the Prophet saying, I do not take responsibility or I disassociate myself from the liability of the blood money that yeah. would normally have gone for manslaughter. But instead, out of magnanimity, the Prophet ﷺ gave half the blood money. Yeah. So there's a very specific context to this hadith, mm -hmm. uh, which unfortunately some don't go into, and then are able, unfortunately, to really reach grand conclusions that conflict um, with the norm, which was Muslims could live in uh, multi-religious or pluralistic societies. Yeah. The other question which is related to this, the question I'd like to ask is, in view of the fact that Muslims have lived in multi-religious societies for the whole life of the Prophet ﷺ, the whole life of the Sahaba, we had non-Muslims in Medina during the Caliphate of all the Caliphs, and you know, in Baghdad, everywhere we had uh, uh, non-Muslims living, at least during the time of the Prophet and his companions. Um, what guidance, what guidelines, what advice would you pick from these for Muslims today who are living as minorities among people of other faiths? Okay, um, going back to the comments by many scholars on that particular verse, there is something that they keep mentioning, which is, to summarize, what is the state in which a Muslim is living, generally speaking? Is a Muslim free to um, practice his religion? That, is, that seems to be the main point they keep raising. In fact, a number of scholars um, have mentioned that even if the community is supposedly a Muslim community, but a Muslim is not free to practice Islam, and you do have um, communities like that even today, is not free to practice Islam, especially where the person is not safe, then they recommend leave that community. So if a Muslim is living in a place where there is persecution of the faith, where the Muslim is not safe by reason of being Muslim, the Muslim is expected to find a safer place. If, however, there is no such concern for safety, there is no persecution of the religion going on, the Muslim is allowed to remain in that place. As we see from the Sira, we've said it again and again. Even in a case where the um, members of that community, they are not friendly towards Islam, they don't want to um, accept Islam, they are not friendly towards the message. The question still is, in as much as they may not be friendly, are you as a Muslim free to practice your faith? Are you safe? Can you live in safety? Which is similar to what we saw with the case of Abbas, um, the prophets, the uncle of the prophet, peace be upon him. The Meccan Muslim, the, sorry, the Meccans, the polytheists, they were not friendly towards Islam. They were looking for ways to oppose Islam. And whoever they could oppress, they did. But because of the family connection that Abbas had, they were not able to actually oppress or harass him so he could live and practice the religion um, freely. Having said those things, we then look at the verses of the Quran, a number of them, where Allah is giving us guidance on how to interact with non-Muslims 
how to speak to them. And even where we want to talk to them about Islam, how should we speak to them? Such verses where he said, you know, if the ignorant address you, just say peace or words of peace. That's clearly for someone who is with people who are not, um, not accepting the message and they are acting or speaking in, very ways, in various ways. We have other verses where Allah says, you know, argue with them, do not argue with them, except in ways that are best or in ways that are, you know, good. So again, here is a situation where Allah seems to be expecting that sometimes these arguments will occur. But he's telling us here are the standards. If you must go into argument or debate or discussion, let it be in a way that is good. So we have advice for how to live with them. We have advice for what to do when living amongst non-Muslims becomes difficult or unsafe. But I think at the end of the day, we ask ourselves, if Allah expects us to share the message, to spread the message with all those many verses that even tells um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, and us by extension, say this, ask that. Therefore, there's an expectation that we will live with them. We will interact with people who are not Muslims and we're expected to carry the message of Islam. And how do we do that if we just all run away and say, no, we won't live amongst Muslims. We will only stay just us. We'll only stay among Muslims. Among, we'll only stay among Muslims. We will not live with non-Muslims. Then how do we pass the message? How do people actually get to see what it means to be a Muslim if they are not watching us being Muslim mm. every day? Jazakillah khairan. Nasir, what would you add? Uh, I think if you look at the Quran, and you look at the hadith of Rasulullah yes. you would find that normally the focus or the purpose of sending Rasulullah sallam, the Quran says Lil Alameen that Rasulullah is a messenger to the entire world uh, not to a particular part of the world but to the whole world and that itself is a testimony that it is expected that Muslims will go all over the world. The inheritors of the Yeah, prophets. because Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has a job. He has a responsibility, he has a mission. And uh, part of the mission is for him to convey the message of Allah to humanity. After the demise of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that responsibility is now in the shoulders of Muslims and particularly scholars amongst Muslims. And that is why, as uh, Sister Salatu rightly mentioned, two of the critical things that are of concern about this moving around are the issue of safety and the issue of influence. Whether one can be influenced positively or, ne or negatively, this issue of intellectual vaccination, that scholars, people that are grounded they are preferred to go around because they are the ones that can represent the message much better. Apart from that, you find, I mean, look at the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself sending Mu'az to Yemen. Exactly. And he said, you are going to meet this kind of people. You are going to meet people of the book. This is the message that the first thing you are going to call them to is believe in Allah. And there are many examples of Rasul sending different groups to different parts of the world, a groups of non-Muslims visiting, exploring for business or wanting or the other. So this is quite common in our history. And because the mission is conveying this message to the world, so ordinarily, you should expect that Muslims will move around. And that was eventually what happened. After the demise of Rasulullah, some companions were sent by Rasulullah himself to go and spread the message of Islam. Others left Medina after the demise of Rasulullah, some for the purpose of business, some for the purpose of educating the world about this very important message of the Prophet. And if you still look back in the Quran, you would find a lot of verses that talks about this Ardullahi Wasia, that the land, the world is so wide and so broad. Can't you go and see? In that, in trying to explore itself is a lesson. You know, Fasiru fil Ard. 
many many examples in the Quran and Sunnah talking about encouraging Muslims to go around. So um, it's not just permissible for Muslims to move around, for Muslims to go and spread the message of Islam, for Muslims to really, really be representative of Allah on earth. It is even encouraged if you look at these verses and ahadiths of the Prophet Wasallam. And if you are reading through history again, you would find a lot of places where scholars are talking about the fiqh of minority, for example. What does that connote? And I'm just wondering, where, where will people like us be if these companions and this, you know, Tabi'un and what have you didn't take the risk to go around to convey this message? Probably it would, it would have been a different story today. So um, I, I would think sometimes those that are given this kind of interpretation, as if they are trying to deprive the rest of humanity, the, the, the benefit of Islam, uh, just like we also benefited because of the effort made by companions and, the, you know, and, and their students of coming to this part of the world, uh, either as traders or as you know, scholars to teach about Islam and to invite Muslim, uh, Muslims. I don't know how do we explain if we only live in a Muslim majority community. Now this idea of Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mu'izati al-hasana wa jadilhum billati hiya ahasan and many other verses around the siru fil ard. And I, I don't know uh, where will that happen. And we, we have a lot in our history because of this issue of, you know, uh, staying with people of other faith and what have you, this idea of dhimma, this idea of covenant and what have you. Uh, where did scholars got all this? If scholars have problem, problem with, for example, staying with people of other faith, then what brings the idea of, you know, ahkam ahl dhimma, for example? What brings the idea of this kind of things? And how do you interpret again the issue of Rasul himself sending his companions to Habasha, where they are just a fraction and they are going to meet the whole you know, country of non-Muslims. So I think um, if you look at the Sira or if you look at the history of the Muslim tradition uh, completely, what seems to be the norm is that it is okay for Muslims to move around. It is okay for Muslims to be everywhere to convey the message of peace, uh, to convey the message of Islam. Um, such examples uh, as cited in the hadith that we earlier discussed are very much an exception that are peculiar to certain contexts. But the norm, what seems to be the general, is for Muslims to go and uh, respect, interact, respect, and hopefully, hopefully, uh, convey and look at that is that is why uh, you often find uh, a lot of reward associated with having influence some people to even accept Islam and that cannot happen if you didn't even meet them so um, we have seen lot of examples in the Quran about all these things and I think this is the norm and it is not just being permissible in my opinion uh, it is not made just permissible in my opinion, but I think it is even encouraged. Allahu alam. In other words, the sunnah seems to be more of diffusion, not osmosis. Exactly. Uh, in other words, how do we move and influence uh, and in realize the Prophet's message as a rahmah lil alameen, the guidance of the Quran as, um, you know, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, and this guidance is for mankind. It only happens through diffusion, through Muslims moving uh, to other places and positively influencing those societies um, in every facet of life, not just in belief. Um, of course, I think as Muslims move, there is a concern for uh, what may be negative influences, um, immorality, racism, um, there may be apostasy, some may leave the religion to join another religion um, and lose their own faith if they don't have a good grounding and better understanding. Uh, and so one can also understand why some are hesitant about just any Muslim going out and would rather, as you said, um, take this precaution of vaccination, you know, take responsibility um, to understand Islam better as you move into other places. Um, and as we find 
uh, when people in these other places start to embrace Islam, you don't say, since you just became a Muslim, uh, leave the society. That's not what happened uh, as a rule in the Sira. If, of course, it's not safe, uh, your faith is not safe, your life is not safe, uh, or you just can't tolerate the persecution, yes, then uh, you leave. But if you can manage it, then as a result of your being there, whatever the potential harm, hopefully the benefit of your being there would be greater, uh, as we saw with the case of Tufail uh, Dosi and these others. In other words, the idea that Muslims should move from what is traditionally called Darul Kufr, you know, uh, a board of disbelief, as some would like to translate it, um, and move to Darul Islam, meaning come to where Muslims are or Islamic rule exists, is not supported by the Sira or the Sunnah. What we have is that only happened when there was persecution. Of course, you don't need to be persecuted to leave. You can leave for any reason. Uh, you can travel the earth, go wherever you want. But the Sunnah of the Prophet and Sahaba, and as you've mentioned, the Sunnah of all Prophets, was Allah sent them to communities where guidance was needed, not where guidance was not needed. Doctors moved to where there were patients, not to where everybody is healthy and there's no need uh, for the guidance. And, you know, the Quran's message is for the whole of mankind. So, so long as we can have peace treaties and the world we live in today is mainly full of Darul Ahad, uh, it's a world with treaties between nations, whether members of United Nations or other forms of peace treaties where people are safe, they've got the freedom to live, to practice their life. Of course, there are exceptions here and there, uh, but to not insist that Muslims who are in minorities uh, should leave or feel guilty about where they were or where they are now, uh, and recognize that throughout the life of the Prophet, we have had Muslims living as minorities and being gradually influential in positively changing these societies to and for the better. I'd like to thank you both for your contributions and the discussion. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Mm -hmm.